Introduction to Theater, Julie Levitt Learson Instructor. The audience. In order to be theater, it must have witnesses. Tracy C. Davis. So let's start with the word theater. What does it mean? I'm kind of a word nerd. So I've done a little bit of an etymological dive into the word and its history and context. Technically speaking, the word theater means the seeing place or the place where one goes to see something. As evidenced here by this photo of Shakespeare's reconstructed globe theater in London, England. Theater comes from a Greek root word called theatron. Makes sense because the ancient Greeks kind of invented theater in the form that we are most familiar with, meaning literally a place for viewing something. By medieval Europe, we're starting to think of this term as an open air place for viewing spectacles and plays. So that Greek word gets co-opted by Latin and then translated into the Romance language of Europe, like French and Italian, théâtre, théâtro, etc. As we mentioned before in our earlier class meetings, right, you only need audience, actors, and a common place in order for you to have theater. So it really wasn't until the 1570s, so a decade or two before Shakespeare was writing and having his work performed, that we really started to think of a theater as a physical building of any specificity. Turning our attention to the audience, the kind of other half of this equation, Right, audience has its root in audio, which is hearing. So this is a medieval term um, with Latin roots, um, all about the state or the act of hearing or listening. So one goes to the seeing place to hear something or listen to something. And we tend to be very visual right now as a culture and focus on the visual effects and things that we see. But in Shakespeare's day, in the late 1500s and early 1600s, people would talk about going to hear a play as opposed to going to see a play. All of this is just to remind you that theater is kind of a multi-sensory experience. We are seeing the actors on stage perform actions. We're seeing scenery and costumes and lighting and special effects, but we're also hearing the words being spoken. And if we are being a lively and attentive audience member, a la our article from last week on Jane Austen and the lively brain, right? Our brains are having those tactile and olfactory and taste sensations that the characters are having as well, at least on the subconscious or semi-conscious level. And I really want to get this kind of down into our way of thinking that theater, when you are in a theater in the presence of actors and watching what's going on and listening and giving it your full attention, it's really a work of chemistry or alchemy almost between actors and audience. Theater is going to both engage the head or the intellectual processes as well as the heart or the emotional processes of the audience members. And in order for this alchemy or chemistry to work, it's going to re rely on audience expectations and experiences as well as the skills and attention of the performers in order for it to be a success. And as we've said before, every single performance is different every time. So quick review from our last discussion. This is all about empathy, which we talked about in class as being this experience of emotional identification between audience member and character, right? Feeling what the character feels or walking a mile in their shoes. And this is a stronger emotional response than sympathy, which is when you kind of more intellectually at a distance feel for the character. Empathy is as closely as you can feeling what they feel, as if you were going through the same experience yourself. So this is really engaging your heart, your heartstrings, your emotion, and your guts. Think about watching like a horror movie and how you're kind of tense and on the edge of your seat and you might jump or scream um, when something exciting happens, right? It's visceral. So this is really, a way for you to be drawn into the world of a play in a very active way. However, there's another side to this coin, 
when we are engaged as an audience member in theater, and that is this notion of aesthetic distance. In some ways, aesthetic distance is the opposite of empathy because aesthetic distance is all about emotional detachment. Or you might call this a psychological separation. It literally translates as the distance of art, right? And this isn't a physical distance. It's not like you take something out on a ruler and measure how many aesthetic distances away you are from a performer. This is an intellectual exercise. But what aesthetic distance allows the audience member is that it gives you this kind of emotional space to be able to judge what you're seeing and hearing um, and be a little bit objective about what you are witnessing. So as I say, this is an intellectual kind of head process. And why this is important is because you need a certain amount of aesthetic distance to remind yourself it's only a play. Because think about it. If you were seeing a play like... Uh, Romeo and Juliet, when there is a sword fight going on and Romeo gets in between Tybalt and Mercutio and when that happens, Romeo puts his life in danger and accidentally or maybe on purpose, Tybalt stabs Mercutio and Mercutio dies. If we were fully 100% engaged with our empathy, we would be treating this as if it was real. And so we might feel compelled to get up and stop what was going on or to yell for help or at least to call 911, right? If you've ever been to the theater with little kids, you can see they are full on empathy mode when they're in the theater and they might yell at the characters or they might scream and cry or they might you know, say what they're feeling in the moment because for kids, it's really easy to get the empathy part and it's a little bit trickier to engage in that aesthetic distance part, right? Little kids have a real hard time discerning fantasy from reality, right? It's all kind of blurry to them because they lack a certain amount of life experience. We, because we are adults, we can kind of engage in both of these things. This is kind of critical. A good performance has us engaging in both of these processes almost at the same time, right? You might have moment to moment, more empathy, less empathy, more aesthetic distance, less aesthetic distance, um, but it's this kind of sliding scale that's being louvered back and forth all throughout the performance. And so what we call this sliding scale of, of empathy and aesthetic distance that's going on all at once is we call this our willing suspension of disbelief. And I like to think of this as a kind of unwritten subconscious contract that the audience and the performers make with each other at the start of a play. On the actor side of this contract, they're gonna promise that they are gonna behave as if what is happening on stage is really real. And so they're gonna do everything possible to make that a convincing and believable reality for us in the audience. And the audience side of that contract is that we're gonna promise to pretend to believe that it is real. Because if we sit there the whole time going, well, that's fake, that's fake, that's fake, we're not gonna have a good time and we're not gonna engage with the work in an empathetic way. But while that's happening, we in the audience and the actors on stage are gonna keep a tiny little corner of our brains reminding ourselves that it's not really real so that we aren't disruptive and so that we don't traumatize ourselves. So this contract, this willing suspension of disbelief, is part of um, a series of rituals or symbols or codes of behavior and expectations that we meet when we are in the theater seeing a play. And what we call these kinds of things are conventions, right? The ways of doing things that make sense in the theater and maybe don't make sense anywhere else. So a convention, as we're using it here, is a way of doing or presenting something in a play that is different from, that departs from reality. But we agree in this subconscious contract that we're making to accept it as true during the duration of the play. And this is a critical piece of our engaging in that willing suspension of disbelief. So what do I mean by this? Well, here's a pretty common convention. Lots of times when there's a scene on a stage that's supposed to be taking place 
at night. You might see the stage flooded with a lot of deep, royal blue light. And then where the actors are or where they want our attention to be focused might be a whiter or brighter yellowish light so that we can see. So this is a convention. It's kind of a like a symbolic shorthand. We see this blue light and we think, aha, yes, nighttime. Or we see blue light with a with a focused area of yellowish or white light. We think, yes, okay, it's moonlight shining in the darkness. When in reality, if we were outside somewhere in the dark of night, it wouldn't really be blue. It would just be dark and we wouldn't be able to see anything or anybody. So if we were sitting in the audience and they were doing an extremely realistic lighting design, it would be kind of boring because it would be really dark and we wouldn't be able to see the people or the scenery. And once we stop being able to see things, our attention starts to wander and our focus starts to go away and we find that aesthetic distance overcoming that empathy and then we're kind of totally out of the play experience and we're lost and confused and disengaged. So we make this easier on everybody. We're trying to give people this sense of nighttime and darkness and moonlight while still allowing the audience to see what's going on and allowing the actors to see each other and the set pieces so that they don't trip over things and hurt themselves. Here's another one. For anybody that's a fan of action movies, right? If there's a bad guy that has planted a bomb, chances are it's gonna look something like this, right? A big bundle of dynamite or C4 or something else that's gonna go boom with a giant red LED display of a clock counting down. Now, I don't have uh, much criminal experience with bomb making or deploying, but I would imagine if I were a criminal mastermind and I was planning to blow something up, the last thing in the world I would want is a big old clock display showing everybody and anybody who has eyeballs to understand what my plan is and how much time they have left, right? I mean, that makes no sense on a, uh, you know, a diabolical, uh, antisocial criminal plan. But in movies, we want the audience members to feel the suspense of the time ticking away and disaster coming closer and closer. And will the hero be able to undo the impending doom before it's over? So having this counter clock display ticking down those seconds really helps ratchet up that tension, really helps increase that emotional response, that empathy that's happening here. And... So we have ways to help make that um, more built in and, and enhanced for our audience. So we have this convention of the red LED display on a bomb. And here are some other conventions that might be in play in the late 20th century or early 21st century audience behavior, right? Expectations are that the house lights, which are the lights over the audience, will dim before the play starts. They might kind of blink on and off for a minute to remind people to get settled and then they'll fade away to black completely, right? So that audience is gonna be in darkness, actors on the stage are gonna be brightly lit. In centuries past and in other places, that's not how theater is performed. In Shakespeare's day, the theater was outside, so the only lighting was the sun, and therefore the players and the audience were equally well lit, right? But this is a convention in our current mode of play going. Uh, today also, we expect that the audience will be quiet in that, you know, not unwrapping uh, cellophane candies or talking on their freaking phones. Oh my God, though, that's a convention that we really kind of need to wrestle with a little bit more. Everybody needs to turn off their damn phones when they go into the theater, right? So we expect that the audience is going to be quiet and with their attention fully focused on the stage, but not so quiet that the performers can't tell that there are people there. We want the audience to be responsive, to laugh at the funny parts, to gasp at the scary parts, to cry at the sad parts, and then to clap um, you know, with great uh, enthusiasm at the end. Other conventions, right, we expect that maybe there's going to be a curtain that covers the set and that will raise and lower or open and close at the start and at the end or in between um, acts or scenes. Um, and we have this expectation that audiences will clap. I'm sure you can think of other ones as well. Beyond that, as audience members, we will come to a play with different sets of expectations. So let's unpack that a little bit. 
you're probably going to have different sets of expectations depending on the kind of play you're going to see, you know, how much money you paid for the tickets, what kind of play it is, um, and all kinds of things like that. So depending on what your expectations are, you know, you're going to react differently if your expectations are met or if they're not met. So what might impact your expectations? Well, maybe the first place to start is with how much money we've spent on our tickets. We're going to have very different expectations if we plunked down, you know, 50 or 100 or 200 dollars or more on a big old Broadway musical spectacle versus if we spent five bucks on a ticket to see our younger brother or sister in their junior high production of Fiddler on the Roof, right? We want to get our money's worth. So if we've paid a lot of money for our ticket, our expectations are going to be higher. We want bigger stars. We want more professional performances. We want, you know, more elaborate scenery and costumes. We expect better dancing, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff, right? We may uh, have some expectations to see a particular star. You know, if Beyonce said she's going to play Cinderella, that's a totally different set of expectations than if it was me playing Cinderella, right? We might have different expectations about the work. For example, if you are going to see a Shakespeare play and you love Shakespeare, um, you might be really pumped to go see it. And then if it doesn't live up to your expectations, you might be disappointed. But if you're like, oh, Shakespeare, I dread Shakespeare, you might kind of psych yourself out and have a terrible time in advance, even if they put on an awesome production. Or you might be pleasantly surprised because you might walk out of there going like, I had no idea Shakespeare was so funny or sexy or moving or whatever, right? Or if you thought it was going to be a comedy and it turns out to be a really serious, you know, drama or tragedy, that might change your emotional response to it, right? Because you went in kind of primed for one kind of emotional experience and you got another one. Or if something, you know, unexpected happened during the performance, uh, an actor suddenly fell ill, or there was a fire in the theater, or a piece of scenery fell down, or something like that, you know, that kind of is jarring um, and, and is going to color your reaction to the whole event. Or if the play is about a subject that you know a lot about or don't know a lot about, um, that might change your experience as well. So there's a lot of factors that go in here. And also, I think your personal mood during that day. I don't know if you've ever, you know, been really stressed out and then gone to see a movie and just like not been able to focus on it or concentrate on it because at the back of your mind, you're worrying about your, you know, the fight you just had with your mom or your big midterm that's coming up tomorrow or, you know, how you're going to make rent or whatever, right? So your own personal kind of mood thermometer is going to impact how you respond to a performance as well. But hopefully you can kind of clear all that aside and just go in and be ready um, to kind of actively participate as an audience member. So let's flip it, right? At bottom, we're going to expect um, the actors to know their lines, know their music and their dancing, that it's going to go off, you know, pretty, pretty good, perfectly flawless technically and all that kind of stuff, right? Unless it is our kid brother or sister in the junior high production of Fiddler on the Roof, in which case, if somebody forgets their line or a set change takes too long or something falls over, we're going to be very, very forgiving because it's going to be totally adorable. If we flip it, professional theater companies are going to have some expectations of their audience. What might those be? Well, hopefully they're going to expect that the audience is going to be respectful of performers, right? They're going to turn off their damn cell phones. They're going to be quiet. They're going to, you know, pay attention to what's going on and they're going to respond appropriately in the right moments. So what do you think happens with the performers when their expectations aren't met? When the audience is distracted or not paying attention or not engaging or not laughing at the funny parts or whatever, right? Well, actors can kind of feel that um, emotional kind of frisson from the audience. And if they're getting the sense that they're not connecting with the audience, that can really throw off the performer's mojo. So they might try even harder to kind of capture the audience's attentions. And sometimes they can bring them around or sometimes that just kind of makes it that much more desperate and awful, you know, kind of trying too hard kind of uh, an experience. Or... 
if the performers are seeing that the audience is completely disengaged, the actors themselves might disengage from what's going on. You know, what we would call phoning it in that they're just like, I'm going to say my lines, but I'm really not going to put my heart and soul in it anymore because why bother? Because you aren't paying attention. Or I've even been in a theater a couple of times when performers have stopped the performance to address the audience. Um, I, I once worked on a show with Brian Dennehy, who, is, who was a long um, careered actor in both film and stage. And somebody's cell phone went off in a performance and he stopped the play, walked to the end of the stage and yelled at them. And then when the person was, you know, suitably chagrined, he kind of took a deep breath, turned around, walked back to his space, took another deep breath and started right back in. So you never know. So all of this is to say that, you know, audiences and their expectations and their reactions are going to impact a performance as much as the performers are themselves. We need each other to have success. Well, let's talk a little bit about what makes a good performance or what makes good theater. Aristotle, who many of you may be familiar with, he was an Athenian from about 300 BCE. So, you know, 2,300 years ago or so. He said, among many other things, he kind of had opinions about all facets of human life and had things to say about theater and wrote them down and we still have them. So here we are. So he said, what theater is striving for is to elicit something called catharsis from the audience. And so if the play doesn't make the audience have catharsis, then the play failed. So what is catharsis? Well, it's this intentional building up and then release of tension in the audience. And that kind of artificial build up of tension and then kind of explosive release of that tension is an emotional cleansing. Right. And if you've ever seen a horror movie or an action film, you've probably had this on some low level. Right. Your body is physically tensing up. You might be holding your breath or breathing very shallowly or rapidly. You might feel your muscles tense. Right. Uh, and then um, when the big explosive ending happens, you might kind of gasp or or um, scream. And all of that tension that you've been holding at the ready is released when you exhale. And that's, um, you know, a kind of catharsis. The reason why it's called an emotional cleansing um, is because when you're doing this, there are all kinds of emotional and physiological things that go on in your body as well, which we will get to later in this semester when we're talking about genre. But enough to know that Aristotle thought that the point of theater was to build up this tension and release it in the audience to create this emotional cleansing. And he called this process catharsis. And so obviously in order to have this emotional, physiological journey and response, it's going to require a high level of empathy from the audience. So that means the performers are gonna to have to perform in a way that elicits empathy from the audience. But that's not the only opinion on what makes good theater. Let's take a moment to talk about Bertolt Brecht, who was a German playwright um, and philosopher. Um, he was living and working in mid 20th century Berlin and barely escaped the Nazis and came to America and kind of finished his career up here. So you might have heard his plays like uh, Mother Courage and Her Children or Galileo and a couple others, a uh, good person of Szechuan and a couple others. So he said, no, 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 we don't want catharsis. So what we want is this is one of my favorite words. We want a Verfremdungseffekt. I think we should just say that word again because it's so damn fun. Verfremdungseffekt. Translating from the German doesn't have quite the same ring, but it means alienation effect or making the familiar seem strange. So what he says is kind of the opposite of what Aristotle was going for, where Aristotle really wanted the audience to be drawn in and feeling what the performers are feeling, the characters are feeling, and have this go on this emotional journey with the characters, really kind of suffer with them, and they build up this tension and then release it. Bertolt Brecht says, no, 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 we don't want that at all. I want the audience to always remember that they are seeing a play and that what they are seeing is not real. And what I really don't want is for them to identify with the characters at all. He says, I don't want empathy. I want this greater aesthetic distance. 
And so he would often do this, you know, if scenes were getting emotional or tense and he would sense that an audience might be starting to get too empathic here, he would intentionally interrupt the action with, you know, a, a tension reliever, something, you know, a little moment of comedy that seems kind of non sequitur and, and, and out of tone so that that tension that was building, like what Aristotle would want, would be immediately released at this much lower level. So you couldn't have that intense catharsis. Now, why would he want to do this? Well, what he wanted was audience members to kind of sit back and and take a more objective look at how characters were behaving and how they were responding to the situations. And instead of going on the emotional journey with them, he wanted the audience to be a little bit more judgy about what was going on and, and to really be like, you are making some terrible choices. You are behaving in a way that is not helpful and look at what the impact of this is and to be more objectively observant than emotionally connected with what's going on. Because Precht, right, and this makes a lot of sense when you think about where he was um, and at what time period, right, during the rise of the Reich in Germany, he really wanted audiences to affect social change. And so if you're on this emotional journey and really identifying with the characters, um, you might not be compelled, compelled to be thinking like, well, this is a terrible way to do things. Let's change it. He really wanted people to see what was wrong with society and make change happen. And he thought this for Fremdung's effect was the way to do it. Switching gears again, let's talk about the Japanese playwright Zayami, who um, was working in the 14th century um, as part of No Theater, N-O-8. And no theater is a particular style of theater as practiced in Japan. It is quite different from how Europeans and Greeks practiced theater um, and how, how most American theater uh, looks and feels um, today. But at any rate, he was interested in this thing called yugen or the hana, which I don't have written down here, but the hana, H-A-N-A, -A, which means literally the flower. And so he's not talking about literal flowers, but he's talking about mystery and depth. And what this really was, was instead of this emotional journey or this sit back and observe it and be kind of judgy about what's going on, but it was kind of this transcendent experience that the actor and the audience feel together when they are both transported to a higher state of spiritual awareness during a performance. Wow, right? And so Zayami was saying the work of theater itself is beautiful and ephemeral, right? Temporary and mysterious like a flower. But we're going to continue to contemplate its meaning and its resonance long after the performance ends. So kind of the effect of this is what lasts with us. And hopefully it brings us to a higher state of consciousness and as I was saying, Zayami was working in no theater, N-O-H, right? That translates literally to skill or ability. And it's talking about this ability to bring about Hana or Yugen, this spiritual transcendence. Okay, so we've got catharsis, which is emotional and physical, or we've got Verfremdung effect, which is intellectual, or Yugen or Hana, which is spiritual. Who's to say which one of these is right or wrong? But these are three different ways um, that three different artists at different eras in theater making societies thought the goal of theater should be and what the ultimate actor audience relationship should be when we are seeing theater. Generally speaking, good theater is going to challenge its audience, whether it's intellectually or emotionally or spiritually. But this is kind of a fine balance, right? You don't want to make it too hard for your audience to find their way in because if it's too much work the audience will turn out the performance entirely so you want to be challenging but still familiar and comforting enough so that the audience can have a good time at the same time if if you don't provide enough meat on the bone or if it's just you know performing for performance sake, that's really kind of pandering without providing any, you know, friction or tension at all, you're going to kind of destroy your audience because they're going to be totally bored that way. 
So this brings us to this kind of great tension, you know, whether theater is art or entertainment, you know, when we're thinking about theater as a form of entertainment, we're thinking about escapism, you know, taking a break from our real lives. We are relieving stress and we're relaxing and we don't really want to feel challenged. But if we think of theater as a work of art, especially art with a capital A, right, that sounds really serious, um, that's going to be more challenging to an audience assumptions. It's going to ask the audience to engage with the work on a deeper level and to question things beyond just what they're seeing on the stage, but to be like, oh, you know, I saw this play Hamlet and it's really about, you know, when is it okay to kill somebody? Is murder ever justified? Hmm, I wonder, right? And so you're going to start to kind of think about that as a deeper level. So when we're trying to create a work of capital A art, um, it may be more of a workout for the audience member to sit through, but hopefully it's still going to be entertaining on some level as opposed to boring, right? So it's still going to be a rewarding, satisfying experience. Both theater as art and theater as entertainment have their place and their value, but probably most of the time when you're at a work of theater, again, it's that sliding kind of continuum back and forth where it's doing both things at different levels throughout the evening. Horace, who was another ancient philosopher um, who had some thoughts on theater, said, art must both please and instruct, which I take to translate as theater must both entertain and challenge. So it's got to be entertainment and art at the same time. Before I wrap up this lecture, I just wanted to return to that article we read last week, The Scourge of Relatability, just for a moment. So remind ourselves, right, empathy is, is thinking or actually feeling your way into the character situation and is requiring the audience to be an active participant in the drama, feeling what the characters are feeling. And then in contrast, relatability, as defined by the article we read, instead is, is demanding that the character becomes like us or the character just shows us ourselves already. And that allows us as audience members to be passive and kind of we miss out on being part of the drama and we also miss out on expanding our own um, experiences. It's kind of like Diet Coke of empathy. Maybe we feel along with the characters, but only because we already feel that way. And so therefore it's nothing really new or exciting or rewarding. But here's just one more thing I, I wanted to say on this, right? All of that is true, right? I'm not a big fan of relatability for relatability's sake, but that said, representation matters. So I've included two images here of little kids um, interacting with um, characters from movies as opposed to live theater, but I think we get our drift, right? Um, when Wonder Woman came out a couple of years ago with Gal Gadot, it was really kind of electrifying for a lot of women and girls to be like, you know, we've had to sit through about 11,000 uh, action hero films with, you know, no real important female characters, their sidekicks or their nurturers or their helpers um, or their love interests, but it's never about them. And we've been told for decades that like, well, you know, we would do a movie about a woman, but, you know, we don't think it will sell it. We don't think people will sit through it. And then Wonder Woman came along and broke all these box office records. And, you know, it was theaters were just filled with women, but also men who were like, we like this. This is great. So seeing oneself on the screen mattered. Right. And then a year or two later, out came Black Panther, the first real um, overt Afrocentric superhero and not just the really compelling and now sorely missed uh, Chadwick Boseman as T'Challa, the Black Panther, but that whole world of Wakanda being this, you know, Afrocentric, magical, amazing kingdom that that displayed the kind of cultural diversity and beauty of what it means to be African. And the kind of cultural phenomenon of that among children, not just in the African-American community, but of course the world over, but especially among, you know, black and brown kids to be like, oh my God, he looks like me. And just the power of feeling part of something that finally the story is about you a little bit um, really resonated emotionally with wide swaths of people who otherwise have kind of felt left out of 
being the central part of the story. So here's my one moment where I'm like, relatability is okay, right? It is good to kind of and big in the tent and, and make more people part of the story. So I'm going to end this lecture with two quotations from playwrights from the turn of the last century. This is from George Bernard Shaw. He wrote many plays, um, probably most famous for a play called Pygmalion, which you may or may not have heard of, but you've probably heard of My Fair Lady, which is the musical that was based on Pygmalion. And I don't know that this was about Pygmalion or if it was about another play that he wrote, but he said once, <laughs> the play was a perfect success. The audience was a dismal failure. So I'm guessing by that, it means whatever performance of his play that he's talking about, the audience wasn't engaged. Now, George Bernard Shaw was known as a very witty writer as well as a, you know, self-serious playwright. So this is kind of snarky what he's saying. So I'm, I'm putting this here because, um, not necessarily because I agree with it, but because a play cannot be a perfect success without an audience engaging with it. So, you know, whose fault it is doesn't really matter at the end of the day so much other than, you know, there was a disconnect. And so both sides of that stage really need to be clicking together in order to have that magic alchemy happening, whether it's for catharsis or the Fremdung effect or the Hana. And here's a quote from another uh, Victorian Irish playwright, Oscar Wilde, um, probably most famous for the importance of being earnest. But here he's talking about opening night of another play by him called Lady Windermere's Fan. And he allegedly spoke this to the audience while they were sitting in their seats after the curtain had closed and before they all took off for the bars. Oscar Wilde reportedly says, ladies and gentlemen, I have enjoyed this evening immensely. The actors have given us a charming rendering of a delightful play, and your appreciation has been most intelligent. I congratulate you on the great success of your performance, which persuades me that you think almost as highly of the play as I do. So it's kind of the other side of the coin of that George Bernard Shaw quote, where Oscar Wilde is recognizing the audience's contribution to the performance. I've been also patting himself on the back to be like, well, you know, a little patronizing, but I think he's kind of humble bragging here, right? And being a little ironic and cheeky, being like, you know, obviously you liked it and that means you've got good taste because I wrote it and I have excellent taste. So that's where I'm going to leave you today. I will see you in class next week.